Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third lecture on discourse analysis. In the second lecture, I provided you with an introduction to genre analysis. We define what a genre is, and then we talked about different types of genres that we come across, both in written discourse and spoken discourse. And then we talked about several things that we look at in genre analysis, in analyzing genres, what are some of the things that we look at? Or how do we approach genre analysis? And that was the focus of the second lecture. In the third lecture, we are going to talk about a particular type of genre, and that is a political speech. In the last part of the second lecture, I made you listen to a political speech delivered by Barack Obama. So this was a speech, if you remember, delivered by Barack Obama when he was first chosen or selected as the president of the United States in 2008. So after this discussion, we are going to focus on this genre or this speech delivered by Obama, and we are going to analyze that speech. But this lecture is going to be, is going to set the foundation for that analysis. So we have already talked about what kind of things we look at in genre analysis. In addition, in this lecture, we are going to talk about some of the characteristics of political speeches, some of the features of political speeches. Then using those, we will analyze Obama's speech. So that's the plan or that's the goal of this discussion. There are some common features of political discourse, especially speeches delivered by politicians. One feature is the use of deictic pronouns. The second feature is the alteration of the word order. The third feature is hedging. Fourth feature is the rule of three. And the fifth feature is contrastive pairs. And the next feature is anaphora and parallelism. And final, the final feature is metaphors. So we're going to talk about how these features are displayed in political speeches and how different speakers make use of these strategies in their political speeches. We are gonna start with the rule of three. What do you mean by the rule of three? The rule of three is a simple concept. The rule of three is you, when you speak, you present something in a list of three items. When you deliver a speech or when you present a list of things, you will present it in a list of three items. And that's what we call the rule of three. Rule of three is actually a strategy that has been used in political speeches over a long time. Dating back from, dates back to the time of the Greek philosophers, even Greek philosophers have used this strategy in their speeches to make it or make them attractive. First, I'm going to show you a short video clip. And this is a song I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And this comes from a famous cartoon um, in Sri Lanka. So let me play the song first.
Right. Now you listen to this famous song. My question to you is out of the lines that you heard in this song, what are the lines that you are most likely to remember? Even after some time, if you listen to this song once or twice, and even after some time back, if you listen to, if you if you are reminded of this song, and what are the lines that you are likely to remind, remember or to be rem reminded of? Well, you all would agree, and that would be Pissamu, Pissamu, Pissupusamu. But why? Why only those lines? What is so special about those lines? Is it simply because of the repetition? Well, if it is repetition, but repetition of how many times? But how many times does the song repeat Pissamu, Pissamu part? Three times. So it is presented in a list of three items. And this is what we talked about, what this is what we said, rule of three. When you present something in a rule of three, you are likely to remember it better, even after some time. Now, let's explore and talk a little bit more about rule of three to figure out what it really means. Rule of three simply refers to a list that contains three items. So three items are presented in a list. The list can be made of words, phrases, clauses, or even sentences. It can be a list of three words. It can be a list of three phrases, or it can be a list of three clauses, or even sentences. Most of the time, when a list is created, they have the same length, or they are of the same length. We would create a list either with three words of the same length or three phrases of the same length, three clauses of the same length, or three sentences of the same length. Max Atkinson, a discourse analyst, someone who is interested in discourse, points out that when a list contains two items, it sounds incomplete and unfinished. 
Now, if you say pisamu, pisamu, and if you stop it there, it sounds very incomplete and unfinished. But when a list contains three items, it sounds very complete and finished. The rule of three is applied to give a sense of unity and completeness to the speech. When something is presented in a list of three items, it gives a sense of unity and completeness. It sounds complete. It sounds finished. And there are many examples of the use of rule of three in our day-to-day -day life. First, we are going to look at some examples of rule of three being used in the religion, in religious literature. Turning to Buddhism, you can see there you can see many examples. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. So that's the rule of three. You have a list of three items. Raga, Dvesha, Moha. It's a list of three items. And if you turn to Christianity, you can see examples like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Once again, you have a list of three items, almost of the same length. Faith, hope, and charity. Once again, you have a list of three items. And here are some very common examples that you come across in literature. The rule of three is a common strategy speakers, writers have used in their discourses. Now, Julius Caesar says, I came, I saw, I conquered. List of three items. Friends, Romans, countrymen, so you have a list of three items. Stop, look, and listen. You have three items on the list once again. Life, liberty, and the pursuit, not pursuit of happiness. So you have once again, three noun phrases forming a list. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So once again, you can see three items presented in a list here. So the rule of three is based on the principle that Things that come in threes or in a list of three items are inherently funnier, more satisfying, more effective than and more effective than any other number. So when something is presented in a list of three items, it's more effective. When used in words, either by speech or text, the reader or audience is more likely to consume the, consume the information if it is written in threes. This idea dates back to ancient Greek rhetoric. So when you present something in a list of three items, your readers are more likely to consume that information or they are likely to remember it better. And that's one reason why the rule of three is commonly being used in discourses, especially political discourse.
When something is presented in a list of three, people tend to remember it better and it is more persuasive. It's more inviting, more persuasive. They're likely to remember it better. By using this device, the speaker increases the listener's ability to memorize the message, and it is also useful to emphasize certain points. The rule of three is important to emphasize certain points. And also the readers or the listeners are likely to remember it better when something is presented in a list of three items. So this is in line with or in agreement with the way information is processed by humans. Humans use patterns in processing information. Could be whether it is visual information or auditory information. So we try to recognize patterns and that's characteristic of how we process information. So three is supposed to be the smallest number require, required to create a pattern. So you cannot create a pattern with two. So three is the minimum or the smallest number required to create a pattern. So when you create a pattern with three items, readers, listeners, are likely to remember it better. A list of three items creates a, creates a pattern and it is brief. Given that it is the minimum, three is the minimum required to create a pattern. And also it is brief, people have a tendency to remember it better. This makes it easier for people to remember. So here is another example for rule of three from a famous advertisement from 1980s. This is an Australian advertisement. And see how in this advertisement, they have nicely used this strategy to convince people or to make people remember their message better. And this is a campaign against cancer, especially skin cancer. Okay, let's watch this first. So what are the three words that you heard in a list? Sleep, slop, slap, right? Sleep, slop, slap. So you can see, now once again, three words are presented in a list of three items. It's a series of items and it has three. The number is three. And it has a, it has 
a very good impact or it creates a very good impact on the listener. Listener is likely to remember it better when it is presented in a list of three items. So notice the rule of three in these examples. So I would let you read these and please notice, identify the rule of three in these. Right, so let's look at the first one. I celebrated Thanksgiving in an old fashioned way. I invited everyone in my neighborhood to my house. We had an enormous fee feast, and then I killed them and took their land. I invited everyone in my neighborhood. We had an enormous feast, killed them and took their land. So you can see there are three verb phrases which are presented in a list of three items. So we have three verb phrases together in a list. And that's what is special about this writing, John Stewart's writing. So it creates an impact on the reader when, when things are presented in a rule of three. And then this famous quotation coming from Abraham Lincoln also has an example of a nice example of rule of uh, example for rule of three. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. of the people, by the people, for the people. So that is the use of the rule of three. Something presented in a list of three items or using the rule of three. Now I'm gonna show you another example, which is, not necessarily a political speech, but it's a famous speech that has been watched all around the world. And the speech is delivered by Steve Jobs. When or in the event of launching, the event that they had for launching the iPhone in 2007. Right, so now let's look at this one. So let me get the video here.
This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. It changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. So, before we get into it, let me. Uh, let me talk about a category of things. The most advanced phones are called smartphones, so they say. And uh, they typically combine a phone plus some email capability, plus they say it's the internet, sort of the baby internet, into one device. And they all have these plastic little keyboards on them. Uh, and uh, the problem is that they're not so smart and they're not so easy to use. So if you kind of make a you know, Business School 101 graph of the smart axis and the easy to use axis. Phones, regular cell phones are kind of right there. They're not so smart and they're, you know, not so easy to use. Um, but smartphones are definitely a little smarter, but they actually are harder to use. They're really complicated. Just for the basic stuff, people have a hard time figuring out how to use them. Well, we don't want to do either one of these things. What we want to do is make a leapfrog product that is way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is. Okay? So, we're going to reinvent the phone. Now, we're going to start with a revolutionary user interface. Is the result of years of research and development and, of course, it's an interplay of hardware and software. 
Now, why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? Motorola Q, the BlackBerry, Palm Treo, Nokia E62, the usual suspects. And what's wrong with their user interfaces? Well, the problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. And they all have these control buttons that are fixed in plastic and are the same for every application. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface, a slightly optimized set of buttons just for it. And what happens if you think of a great idea six months from now? You can't run around and add a button to these things. They're already shipped. So what do you do? It doesn't work because the buttons and the controls can't change. They can't change for each application, and they can't change down the road if you think of another great idea you want to add to this product. Well, how do you solve this? Hmm. It turns out we have solved it. We solved it in computers 20 years ago. We solved it with a bitmap screen that could display anything we want, put any user interface up, and a pointing device. We solved it with the mouse, right? We solved this problem. So how are we going to take this to a mobile device? Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away, and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. So let's not use a stylus. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. We're going to touch this with our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch, which is phenomenal. It works like magic. <laughs> you don't need a stylus. It's far more accurate than any touch display that's ever been shipped. It ignores unintended touches. It's super smart. You can do multi-finger gestures on it. And boy, have we patented it. <laughs> so, so we've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user interfaces to the market in our time. First was the mouse. The second was the click wheel. And now we're going to bring multi-touch to the market. And each of these revolutionary user interfaces has made possible a revolutionary product. The Mac, the iPod, and now the iPhone. So a revolutionary user interface. We're going to build on top of that with software. Now, software on mobile phones is like, it's like baby software. It's not so powerful. And today, we're going to show you a software breakthrough, software that's at least five years ahead of what's on any other phone. Now, how do we do this? Well, we start with a strong foundation. iPhone runs OS X. Yeah. Now, why, why would we want to run such a sophisticated operating system on a mobile device? Well, because it's got everything we need. It's got multitasking. It's got the best networking. It already knows how to power manage. We've been doing this on mobile computers for years. It's got awesome security. And to write apps, it's got everything from Coco and the graphics, and it's got core animation built in. And it's got the audio and video that OS X is famous for. It's got all the stuff we want. And it's built right in to iPhone. And that has let us create desktop class applications and networking. Right? Not the crippled stuff that you find on most phones. This is real desktop class applications. Now, you know, one of the pioneers of our industry, Alan Kay, has had a lot of great quotes throughout the years. And I ran across one of them recently that explains how we look at this, explains why we go about doing things the way we do, because we love software. And here's the quote. 
people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. You know? Alan said this 30 years ago. And this is how we feel about it. And so we're bringing breakthrough software to a mobile device for the first time. It's five years ahead. Right. So, so what are some examples of the rule of three that you heard in this speech? Did you hear any examples of the rule of three? Yes, right. So let's look at some examples of the rule of three. So let me share it once again, so that we can together have a look at. Apple has been, it's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple, it changed the whole computer industry. So this is one example, so carefully listen to this. In 1984, we brought this and it did not just change this. So this is the first item on the list. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. Right, so once again, this is another example of the rule of three. And see how he's repeating, how he's repeating this list in order to create an impact on the audience. Nice. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> right, so you can see um, he is using the rule of three very effectively in his uh, speech right at the beginning. Um, he talks about, he, he, introduces, he introduces this list of three items um, and also, when he talks about what they introduced in 1984, 2001, and 2007, that is also um, another example of the rule of three. He's using the rule of three there as well. So this is a speech in which the rule of three has been used very effectively. Going back to the slides, So the rule of three is a strategy people use in their speeches, mainly in political speeches to create a special impact on the listener or the reader. 
generally they are in, 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 in rule of three, there are three items presented in a list. And so we have seen many examples. So let me, let me see whether I can find another example of the rule of three for you. සැමදාමත් මම උදේසනින් කරනදී මගේ පවුලේ සෑම අභියෝගයක්ම ජය ගන්න ඉතාමත් වැදගත්. ඒ වෙනුවෙන් මට සහාය වෙන්නේ රන්වන් මෝල්ට් ගුණයෙන් සහ පෝෂණීය කිරිසාරයෙන් සපිරි පරිපූර්ණ නෙස්ටර් මෝල්ට්. බලය, ජවය, ශක්තිය නෙස්ටර් මෝල්ට්. නෙස්ලෙ ගුඩ් ෆුඩ් ගුඩ් ලයිෆ්. සැමදාමත් මම උදේසනින් Right, so even in this advertisement you see they have used the rule of 3 when they say ජවය, බලය, ශක්තිය and that's a list of three items when something is presented so you you can is they can easily add another item but why do they maintain a list of three items why do why have they created a list of three items because when you have a list of three items it's when 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 a list consists of three items the the kind of impact that it creates on the listener is much more than when a list contains any other number so that's the that's the finding and that's the rationale behind the use of the three or the list of three items uh using a list of three items which is known as the rule of three right so let's go back to the slide so the first thing that we have talked about is the rule of three now we are going to talk about the second feature or characteristic and that is contrastive pairs what do we mean by a contrastive pair the introduction of two opposites together to create a contrasting effect and that's what we mean by a contrasting pair the introduction of two opposites so classical greek and roman writers have called this antithesis that is the use of contrastive pairs here is a definition of contrastive pairs contrastive pairs refer to a figure of a speech involving a seeming contradiction of ideas words clauses or sentences and you have a there is a contradiction that is made with two words two clauses to two sentences within the balanced grammatical structure so that means um if you have a pair it has to be two items it has to be the two words two clauses two sentences and a word and a sentence may not necessarily make a pair but two words would make a pair two sentences would make a pair two clauses would make a pair so that's why it says with the balanced grammatical structure parallelism of expression serves to emphasize opposition of ideas so when you have two words combined to form a pair or two clauses are combined to form a pair or two sentences are combined to form a pair you can achieve parallelism as well though the structure has parallelism but if you combine a word with a clause they are not parallel so parallelism of expression serves to emphasize the opposition of ideas so it can emphasize the kind of opposition or the contrast that is intended so that's according to the columbia encyclopedia contrastive pairs help politicians gain the applause from the audience so contrastive pairs are commonly used in political speeches in addition to the rule of 3 contrastive pairs are used commonly in political speeches because they have they can create an impact on the listener or the reader let's look at this example to understand what we mean by a contrastive pair once 
one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This is what Neil Armstrong is supposed to have said after landing his feet on the moon. And this is what he says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So identify the contrast to pairs that you have in this quotation. One small step, one giant leap. Now you have a contrast to pair established here. This, the second contrast to pair established here is man and mankind. Small step, giant leap, man, mankind. So you have two examples of contrastive pair in this example. This is a very good example for contrastive pairs coming from A Tale of Two Cities, a novel by Charles Dickens. Now read this carefully and try to identify the contrastive pairs and underline all the contrastive pairs. So look at the examples that you have here for contrastive pairs. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. This is a series of contrastive pairs. The best of times, the worst of times. So you have a contrastive pair. The age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. Once again, another contrastive pair. Age of wisdom is contrasted with the age of foolishness. It's the epoch of belief and the epoch of incredulity. incredulity. So the period of belief and incredulity. So once again, a contrastive pair. Contrast is established. Light, darkness. Hope, despair, everything before us, nothing. Everything contrasted with nothing. Heaven, the other way. So you have a list of, so you have a, you have a series of contrastive pairs in this dialogue or in this discourse or in this text. And it is the use of contrastive pairs that makes this discourse or this text really powerful, is able to create a very, very um, interesting impact or nice impact 
powerful impact on the reader due to his employment or the use of contrastive pairs. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Once again, the use of the contrastive pairs. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but we can, but it can never forget what they did here, say and did. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character. The color of a skin, of their skin, the content of their character. So once again, a contrastive pair established. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. So thy ear, thy voice, a contrastive pair is established. So the second strategy that many speakers used in their speeches, dating back from the time of the Greek philosophers, the golden era of Greek history, time of the Aristotle, Plato, and so on, they have used this characteristic feature, or this strategy to make their speeches, to make the speeches powerful. So with this, we are gonna to move to the third strategy used in political speeches. That's the use of hedging. Let's first look at these examples to understand what we mean by hedging. It seems that some students don't take their studies seriously. The man at the, at the front desk will probably be able to help you. Report says that many students use some sort of energy drink when they study. I think buying a car on a loan has more advantages than leasing it. Now, if you take these sentences, And if you carefully read, you can see that some of the expressions that we have here, like it seems, probably, a report says, I think. If you carefully read, you can identify these expressions straight away. What do these words or phrases actually do in each sentence? What do they do in these sentences? What kind of impact do they create in these sentences, these underlined phrases or words? Well, Compare the first sentence with the part, it seems that, and without that part. That would be, some students don't take their studies seriously. Some students don't take their studies seriously. Compare that sentence with, it seems that some students don't take their st studies seriously. So what kind of impact does this phrase create or have on, what, what kind of impact, impact does it have on the sentence? The addition of this part, it seems. Look at the second one. The man at the front desk will be able to help you. Compare that with the sentence with probably, the man at the front desk will probably be able to help you. So the addition of these phrases, which are underlined in these sentences, seem to reduce the power of what we are saying. 
they seem to reduce the power of or the strength of what we are saying. These expressions which have been underlined or words or phrases are called hedges or they are called hedging examples of these are examples of hedging. These are hedges and they reduce the power of the sentences. Hedges. So now let's look at what we mean by hedging. Hedging refers to a linguistic device. It's a linguistic device or a strategy which has an impact on the way a certain utterance is interpreted by a listener. It's a linguistic device which has an impact on the way an utterance is interpreted by a listener. I can probably figure it out on my own. Now, suppose someone says, I can figure it out on my own. So what kind of impression do you get? You assume that the person is capable of figuring out whatever he is talking about in that particular context. But, if the person adds these words or this particular word probably and says, I can probably figure it out on my own. What kind of impression do you get of this person? So this word probably has or creates an impact on the way the utterance is interpreted by the listener. I would understand that he's not 100% sure whether he's able to figure it out on his own or not. So it reduces the addition of the word probably reduces the power or the strength of the utterance. So what does the word probably do in this sentence? It reduces the force of the word can. So this is an example of hedging. Hedging mitigates or attenuates the force of the utterance. So what hedging does is to reduce the power of power of an utterance. Quotes defines hedges as linguistic forms such as I think, I'm sure you know, sort of and perhaps, which express the speaker's uncertainty, sorry, certainty or uncertainty about the proposition under discussion. So when you add something like, I think, I'm sure you know, sort of, and perhaps they add or they convey the speaker's attitude, point of view, or the level of certainty, certainty or uncertainty that the speaker has over a certain proposition. I sort of like it. I like it. I may go there versus I'm going there. You can see the sentences begin to convey different things depending on the kind of hedges that we use. I think we all have to be very careful nowadays with the new trend that we see in the spread of Corona. Now I have added, I think at the beginning of the sentence and that adds certainty or uncertainty 
about the proposition or the expression that I'm creating. Hedging is a rhetorical strategy. By including a particular term, choosing a particular structure, imposing a specific prosodic form in the utterance, the speaker signals a lack of a full commitment either to the full category membership of a term or expression in the utterance. So it's called content mitigation. Or, the, or to the intended elocutionary force of the utterance, the force mitigation. So mitigating is basically reducing the power of an utterance. How do we reduce the power of an utterance? By adding one of the hedges. So the speaker signals lack of full commitment or certainty when he or she uses one of the hedges. Common hedges are, I think, I'm sure, you know, sort of, perhaps, even model verbs, word, uh, words can be considered as hedges. And these are the different hedges, people. Hedging is a common strategy people use. People use hedges very commonly in their discourses, especially in, in the spoken discourse. Hedges as originally defined by Lakoff are words whose meanings involves fussiness, words whose job is to make things fussier or less fussy. They don't make things clear, neat and precise, but they make things fussier. Word or phrase such as possibly or I think that mitigates or weakens the certainty of a statement. And that's what the hedging, the, that's what a hedge or a hedging, that's what hedging would do. Hedging is also commonly used in academic writing. When we want to make a careful statement about something, this is called cautious language. It's a feature of academic discourse. Sometimes we make very strong claims in academic right. We would say something like, especially in the case of making a prediction, we can say something like, if this continues, Many people will experience drastic consequences of the situation. Now you can make, reduce the impact of that, that utterance or use very cautious language, language by saying, if this continues, many people are likely to face many consequences. So that is lighter, that one is less, creating a less impact or less serious. The claim made by this utterance is not as powerful as the claim made in the first sentence. So this is because it reduces the impact of the utterance, so it has a mitigating effect. So there are different types of hedges that people use. Model auxiliaries are used for hedging. What do we mean by model auxiliar auxiliaries? Can, could, may, might, would, should, must. They are commonly used for hedging. This is consistent Polka's suggestion that a high degree of phonetic similarity between two non-native six segments could increase perceptual difficulty for the listener. So this is an example. As you can see, could increase versus increases. They convey two different meanings. We also have modal lexical verbs 
to indicate a doubt. And some of these lexical, modal lexical verbs include seem, appear, believe, assume, suggest, estimate, tend, think, argue, to indicate, propose, speculate, etc. I assume, I suggest, I argue, I think, I tend to, he tends to think. It is a speculated that. It is proposed that. It seems that. He seems to think. So these model lexical verbs are used once again to indicate, to, to reduce the power of the, the utterance. In spite of its limites, limitations, the study appears to have a number of important strengths. We also have modal adverbs sometimes used commonly for hedging, perhaps, possibly, probably, likely, presumably, virtually, apparently. This is not an exhaustive list and there are many more modal adverbs people can, can you can find in speeches. But the goal in using these is to reduce the power of, reduce the power of an utterance or mitigate Lower salaries, possibly the reason why many young people are reluctant to enter the profession of teaching. So we have model nouns like possibility, assumption, suggestion, claim. You can say there's a possibility that, there's an assumption that, it's a suggestion that, there is a claim that, so this is this when these words are used in the noun form, they are called model nouns. Model nouns, model adverbs, they all are used. And lexical verbs, they are used to mitigate the power of an utterance. It's a general assumption in society that younger learners are faster than adults in second language acquisition. We also have approximators of quantity, frequency, degree, and time. These are also examples of hedging. They also reduce the power of an utterance, approximately, most, relatively, frequently, roughly, occasionally, generally, usually, somewhat, somehow, a lot of, so these words are referring to quantity, frequency, degree, time. They reduce the power of an utterance. We also have some introductory phrases which are very characteristic or typical of hedging. I think, I believe, in my view, to my knowledge, we feel that. So whenever you have something at the beginning, like this in a sentence, the power of that sentence, the, the expressive power of that sentence is less than a sentence that may not have these introductory phrases. If clauses, if true, our study contradicts the myth that men make better managers than women. So if closer souls are also hedges. So agentless, passive and impersonal constructions, it is believed that an attempt was made, your request has been evaluated. So these are called impersonal constructions, which also can be considered as hedges or hedging, and they also reduce the power of an utterance. Um, compound hedges are hedges, which are created with the combination of different new strategies. It may suggest, suggest that it seems likely. So you have the likely, the use of an adverb, and this lexical model 
combined together. So you can combine a few strategies of hedging in the same sentence, and that is called compound hedging or compound hedges. So according to Lobin's lack of women uses more hedges than men in speech. Uh, well, is this true? And think about it. Is there more uncertainty expressed in women, women's speech than men's speech? And is this culturally the same? Would we expect to see the same thing in a Sri Lankan context as well? So that's something that we need to talk about. Okay, so summarizing our discussion up to this point, we have looked at three different strategies used by people in their speeches, mainly political speeches. One is the use of the rule of three. Second is the use of contrast you pay us in speech. And the third is the use of hedging or hedges. So when you listen to a speech or when you go through a speech, now you should be able to identify these examples. So what are some of the examples for the rule of three? What are some examples for hedging and what are some examples for contrastive pairs? So we're gonna do some exercises in class as well. And we will, we have another few items to talk about from the list, initial list that we had. Characteristics or strategies of political speeches. So we will discuss those in the next lecture. So I'll see you in the next lecture then.